Test one, two, one, two. Test, 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 test. Oh, right. Hey, hey, hey. Now try it. Is that better? One, two, two, one, two. Yeah, okay. Mine has to be up. I turned the amps off right now. So, okay. Test one. So that was on. So it gives yeah. it off. It work? Yep. Yeah, it works. Try that. See how that works. Okay. I'm assuming it will. Also. There's. It's not on out there. Oh well, the choirs. No, the choir should be off too. Choirs out there. That should be. One, two, two, one. Test one, two. Hello, Harold. Are you there? All right. All right.
Good morning, First Methodist Sherman. Good morning to those of you who are worshiping with us online. We are so glad that you're here with us this morning. If you have not already done so, if you would please sign in on the attendance registers that you will find on each row and make sure you pass them down to the people next to you so that they have an opportunity to let us know that they're worshiping with us today. And if you're worshiping with us online, I would invite you to sign in on the... Um, the feed that is underneath the video this morning. So and thank you for doing that so that we might know that you're worshiping with us and find ways that we might connect you to the mission and ministry at First Methodist Sherman. There are just a few announcements this morning. The first is that I want to call your attention to the front of the bulletin if you're in person. This is a list of activities and Bible studies and other things that are going on in the life of the church. If you have questions about any of those things, please feel free to call the church office, to email someone on the staff, and we will um, help you to uh, get connected and to answer any questions about those things that you might have. There is, after worship today, a CHARGE conference meeting. CHARGE conference is a yearly meeting where we uh, attend to some of the business of the church. If you are available for that meeting, we would invite you to that. It is in Binkley Hall. Um, we will have some lunch together. We will vote on the items that need to be voted on, and we will fellow and have a time of fellowship together. I hope that you will attend that following this worship service. Um, this week, at, on Saturday, there is a retreat at the Pro Throw Center with the Reverend Dr. Ben Marshall, who will be leading that retreat. Uh, if you have never spent time apart and uh, drew close to God, intentionally had time apart to draw close to God and to draw close to the people who are in your um, who are in the small group with you. This would be a great opportunity for that. It starts at 9 a.m. for a time of gathering. There will be time of Bible study and prayer and fellowship during the day. Um, we say that it goes until three o'clock. We never really go until three o'clock, but that gives us time to um, debrief and for people to stay if they would like to stay or leave at their leisure when we are finished. Uh, ben Marshall has been a colleague and a mentor to me and to many uh, pastors in the conference. Um, it's rare that he gets this time, and so I'm just excited to be able to offer this. So if you have questions about that, please um, contact me this week. Prothrow is going to need a, a head count by Thursday, and so I would love to be able to do that um, before then, actually. Um, Trunk or Treat is coming up. It is October 23rd. If you have a trunk that you would like to put in the Trunk or Treat, we would love to have you. Uh, that event is just a lot of fun. It gives us an opportunity to meet people in our community. Um, the kids come dressed up. A lot of the parents come dressed up. We give out more candy than we should be giving out on that day. Dentists love us for trunk or treat. Um, but we line all of Mulberry Street, and, it, um, and we close it down. And last year, there were over 200 children that came through. We were running out of candy 45 minutes before. This is one of the few times I'll say, thank God it rained on our parade. Because I'm not sure what we would have done that day, but it did rain and we had to close it down. So I hope that you will uh, sign up to do that. You can sign up online. There's a QR code for that. Or you can just call uh, the church office or get a hold of Jennifer Snyder, our children's director, and she will get your trunk signed up for that. If you don't don't want to do a trunk, we are happy to take candy because most of us don't buy enough candy and we need uh, to be restocked. And so if you bring candy, we will restock the cars, uh, the trunks as they run out of candy. Uh, finally, I'm going to, well, one more announcement. If you have not had an opportunity to, to pick a tag off of the Stock the Teacher Lounge board, I think there's two or three items left on that board. And uh, so if you would like to do that on your way out today, please stop by, grab a tag, bring your item back. Um, and if you would like to donate toward that, we will take your money. So um, no matter how you want to participate in that, we would love for you to do that. And the teachers truly appreciate the outreach from this church to them. And so I hope that you will do that. I'm going to invite Jerry Holbert up for an announcement uh, and I hope that you will turn your attention to Jerry at this time. This is getting to be regular. <laughs> <clears throat> 
all right, I've been pretty nice up to now. <laughs> Taking the gloves off. You need to, if you have not been to one of our round tables, we had uh, one on uh, Saturday, we had one on, uh, when was that last one? Monday. Uh, and now we have another one next Sunday at 3 o'clock. Uh, there will be food. I don't know what kind of meal you serve at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, but uh, I suggested a charcuterie board, but uh, we'll see what we get. But I want you to be there. And to show you how important it is, we're on page three of the bulletin, but it takes up half the page. So you definitely need to be there. And for an added incentive, there will be a door prize this time. So you need to be there to be in on the door prize. The door prize will be one of my bow ties. <laughs> I've decided to cut down, and so after Next Sunday, I will only have 136 bow ties. <laughs> so why don't you be there? You need it. I'll even give you tying instructions on how to tie the bow tie. Okay, gentlemen, you need to be there. Ladies, you need to be there because you want your gentlemen to look sharp. <laughs> See you there. And on that note... I'm going to call all of us to turn our attention to God who has called us here to worship this morning. Good morning, church family. My name is Laura Muller, and I am the Director of Communications and Youth Ministries here at First Methodist Truman. If you will please rise and join me in our call to worship. The invitation is given to every person by Jesus Christ. Come to me, follow me, be my disciples. We come to this place, to this time, at the invitation of Jesus Christ. In the name of Christ, we accept the invitation to discipleship. In the name of Christ, as his disciples, we worship and praise God. In the midst of a world where cruelty abounds, we proclaim the God of compassion. In the midst of despair that threatens to swallow up whole lives, whole peoples. We proclaim the God of hope. In the midst of indifference and apathy. We, we proclaim, proclaim the, the God, God of love. love. Let, Let us worship, worship together and share our witness of God's living presence in, in the world. world. Amen. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is from The Faith We Sing, hymn 2101, Two Fishermen. Before we sing this hymn, it is very wordy, and some of you are like, I don't want to sing all of those verses. So we're going to have a rehearsal on the refrain. So at least you can sing the refrain. So we'll have a quick little rehearsal. Sing with me. Leave all things you have and come and follow me and come and follow me let's do that one more time because i think that can be better you ready and here we go leave all things you have and come and follow me and come and follow me now let us join in our hymn Two fishermen who lived along the Sea of Galilee Stood by the shore to cast their nets into an ageless sea Now Jesus watched them from afar, then called them each by name It changed their lives, these simple men, they'd never be the same Leave all things you have and come and follow me, and come and follow me. And as he walked along the shore, t'was James and John he'd find. And these two sons of Zebedee would leave their boats behind. 
Their work and all they held so dear they left beside their nets. Their names they'd heard as Jesus called, they came without regret. Leave all things you have and come and follow me, and come and follow me. O oh, Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, beloved one, you heard Christ's call to speak good news revealed to God's own Son. Susanna, Mary Magdalene, who traveled with your Lord, you ministered to him with joy, for he is God adored. Leave all things you have and come and follow me, and come and follow me. And you good Christians, one and all who'd follow Jesus' way, come leave behind what keeps you bound to trappings of our day. And listen as he calls your name to come and follow near, for still he speaks in varied ways to those his call will hear. Leave all things you have and come and follow me, and come and follow me. Please join me in the modern affirmation. We believe, believe in, in God, God the Father, Father infinite, infinite in wisdom, power, power and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. seated. Our hymn of preparation, hymn 344 in the United Methodist Hymnal, singing verses 1 and 2, Lord, you have come to the lake shore. to the lake shore, looking neither for wealthy nor wise ones. You only ask me to follow humbly. Oh Lord, with your eyes you have searched me, and while smiling in my name. Now my boat's left on the shoreline behind me. By your side I will seek other seas. You know so well my possessions. My boat carries no me and 
was smiling, have spoken my name. Now my boat's left on the shoreline behind me. By your side, I will seek other seas. This is week three of the Red Letter Challenge. And we all know that there are a lot of red letters in our Bibles and our Gospels. And there's a lot of things that those words have to say about faith and about the practice of our faith. I believe that the author here identifies these five things he calls challenges. I like to call them practices. But these five challenges are each distinct and yet so important in the life of faith. We started with um, being, and then forgiving, serving, giving, and going. Those things, he said, are the crux of what it means to be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. We started with being, being with Jesus specifically, and what being with Jesus really means for us You know, that it's more than just saying that we believe in Jesus, but that that we actually spend time with Jesus, that it's a time that we set apart so that we can be the people that God has called us to be as we spend time with Christ. And the most amazing thing in being with Jesus is that while the being with Jesus for us is a choice, Jesus has already chosen to be with us regardless of what our choice is or isn't, regardless of how long it takes us to make a choice, Jesus has already chosen, and Jesus has chosen us, and Jesus has chosen to be with us. Last week, Abby preached a fabulous sermon on forgiving and on forgiveness, and she started that so vulnerably when she said that she personally struggles with forgiveness, with what it means to forgive people, for what it means to be the people who not only receive the forgiveness of God, but then offer forgiveness to others. And I think she led us on a journey that allowed us to admit that we don't always readily Forgive those who have harmed us or who have harmed people we love. And yet, the more we are able and willing to forgive others, the freer we become as God's people because we are no longer bound by the anger and the bitterness that unforgiveness uh, causes in our souls. And, And that was probably one of the best ways I could describe what it means to live a life of unforgiveness as opposed to living a life filled with the forgiveness of Jesus Christ for us. And I think those two things, being and forgiving, are really the hinges to the next three weeks. I think that if you haven't been with Jesus and you're not willing to at least embrace some of what Jesus says about forgiveness, then serving and giving and going to be the hands and feet of Christ are just that much more difficult. So today we're going to hear some, some of those red letters about serving. And serving is one of those things that I think we, we believe that we know what it means to serve. And I'm not sure that we fully have embraced what it means to serve Christ and serve others. And so I'm going to read a, a familiar story, another one of those familiar stories from the, the Gospels. And um, some of you may be thinking, aren't there better stories about serving? And the answer would be yes. But I chose this one because I think this is where we start, right? I think we start here with Jesus' call on our lives. And so I'm going to invite you to listen to this very familiar story. Listen, if you have taught VBS or Children's Sunday School or have been around the church at all, you know this story, and you're going to start singing the song in your head because it's been stuck in mine for quite a while now. So listen now to these words from Luke 5, starting in the first verse. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. 
he got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet, if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When Christ calls a person, says Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he calls them to come and die. Those were the words that he spoke at a time when he stood in opposition to Adolf Hitler and the fascist regime from a death camp in Auschwitz, where he was, where he would lose his life. I'm not exactly sure that we all need to take those words as literally as Bonhoeffer spoke them, but surely as we sit here today, we are all called to die for Christ. We are called to die to the old ways of living, the old attitudes and behaviors that we have learned over the course of our lifetimes, and to begin to live the new life that Christ has offered to all of those who claim to follow him. This is not something new. We hear this in our baptismal vows. We understand that in the waters of our baptisms, we are crucified with Christ so that it is no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us. This is what it means for us, then, to come and die. We die to ourselves, and we take on this new life that Christ offers to us. Now, I'm not sure when Peter heard Jesus' call to him that he understood exactly what he was getting into, no more so than I think any of us truly understand what it means to be called by Christ into a life of service to Christ. But yet, Peter did exactly what Jesus asked him to do. Let me get on your boat and push out a little ways because this crowd that's been following me and growing in number needs to hear a word of grace from God. And so that's exactly what Peter did. Peter opens up his boat after fishing all night to Jesus and pushes out a little from shore. Now, for us to get a clear vision as to why Jesus would have done this, we need to know a little bit of geography here so that this starts to make sense. If there are, in fact, a few hundred people following Jesus, certainly it doesn't make sense that he would push out from shore and start talking to them. But the area around the Lake of Gennesaret is actually an uneven shoreline filled with really high, craggy hillsides all around it. And so they create a sort of amphitheater, natural amphitheaters all along that coastline. So when Jesus pushes out just a little ways from the shore, what he has the ability to do is to speak in a regular voice, and his voice will carry then up that hillside so that everybody there could hear him speaking. And that's what he does. If you ever wonder if Jesus is resourceful, I think Jesus is a pretty smart guy. He knows the area that he lives in and he understands how to use what's available to him to preach the gospel. And that's what he does. And, you know, the truth is, is it wasn't just the crowd that was listening to Jesus that day. There were some people that never expected to hear Jesus that day. And that was the fishermen, Peter, James, and John, the three business partners. They had fished all night long and they were tired and yet there they were being invited to push out a little from shore. Push out a little. 
Help me out here, bud. And so they did. And there was a little bit of pushback. You get those words from Peter, right? Like, I'm really tired right now, Jesus, and we've been fishing all night. But okay, let's get out there and I'll let you do your thing. But I don't think it was just that Peter was tired, right? Because when Jesus tells him, let's go out into the deep water and cast your net over the side, I think that Jesus is crossing some lines with Peter, if, that's, if it's okay for me to say that out loud. You know, Peter is the expert here. He is a fisherman. This is how he made a living. He knows something about fishing. And they had fished all night long, which is typical in that part of the world. You fish at night. That's when the fish can be caught. So now they're tired. They're ready to go home. Somebody needs a rest. And yet Jesus. Jesus knows that there's more than meets the eye here. And so Peter does what Peter does, and he says, okay, we'll do that. And he pushes out, and they put those nets over, and there are hundreds of fish in the blink of an eye. The expert was shocked. And so they, they try to pull, Peter tries to pull up those nets, and there's so many fish that another fishing boat comes over, and there's so many fish that both boats are ready to sink. And Peter has what I like to call an aha moment. This is no ordinary guy. This is not just a good teacher who's had a good rabbi and a few good mentors along the way. This is someone who brings the abundance of God's kingdom to earth as it is in heaven. And so what happens in those very moments is Peter recognizes how unworthy he is where he is. And he and he's in shock, and he's in awe, and fear overwhelms him, and he falls to his face, and he begs for mercy. You see, I think in that very moment, Peter understood that no matter how good he ever thought he was, no matter how good deeds, how many good deeds he had done, no matter how many prayers he had prayed, no matter how often he showed up in temple, this encounter This encounter was beyond anything he could wrap his hands or his mind or his heart around. So he fell to his knees and he asked Jesus to leave him. There is a sense in that moment that what he did was absolutely what any one of us should have, could have, would have done in those moments when we recognize that we are not as good as we think we are and we fall before Jesus And we ask for mercy because we are afraid of the judgment that is in line with where we are in that moment. But Jesus doesn't judge Peter. What Peter gets is what Peter does not deserve. Peter receives grace. Peter receives grace, not judgment. I can say that when we receive grace, when we know that we don't deserve what we're getting, things happen. In some mysterious way that we don't understand, we begin to see ourselves for who we really are. We see the masks that we wear every single day that say, oh, I'm fine. I've got it all together. I do all the right things all the time. We start to see the root of bitterness that is, that is taken over our hearts that make us hard-hearted toward the people that we're supposed to love. We see the mistrust in systems and in people and in institutions. We start to see that actually we are much more selfish people than we think we are. That all of our open hands really come from a sense of should have, would have, could haves instead of I do this because it's the right thing to do, because it's what we're commanded to do, called to do. It's the ought to do's that force us to do some things that make us look really good. We start to see, not in a mirror dimly, but in a mirror fully. And all we can do is ask for mercy. We are, in some very real way, all Peter. 
And yet, in some very real way, like Peter, we don't get what we deserve. We receive grace. That is the message here, that it's not about just pushing out in the deep water and doing what we're told. And certainly there's a sermon in there that obedience is really, really important to Jesus. But is that all it is? Are we only taught to be obedient? Or are we taught to recognize that that there's something missing in us, that even when we're obedient, sometimes we're not being obedient to Jesus, but we're being obedient because we want other people to see the good things that we're doing. And Jesus says, no, no, there's something else here. There's a word of grace that comes in those moments to all of us, the same word of grace that you find throughout the scripture, the word of grace that is given to us. And the word is, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of judgment because I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to love you. Don't be afraid of the others who I'm going to show you need to hear these words of grace because I'm going to give you what you need to speak those words of truth into their lives. Don't be afraid to open up your hands and your hearts and your homes because that is where I reside. This is the word of grace to all of us, those same words of grace to Peter. And then, as if that wasn't enough, Jesus then goes on to say, and by the way, you're going to come with me and you're going to catch a few new people. People who you can't even begin to imagine that you're going to be in relationship with. People who you would never normally be present to. I'm going to show you how to do all of these things. And so what does Peter do? And what what do the sons of Zebedee do? They leave it all behind. Everything. They die to their old lives and they pick up this new life with a person they don't even know. Because let's face it, there's no indication that Peter had ever met Jesus before today in this story. I'm just going to leave it all behind. I'm going with you because catching people sounds like a good job, said nobody ever. I know that this is difficult for everybody to hear this that instead of the judgment we deserve because we're not as good as we think we are, we get grace that we're not called to just stay where we are and do everything the good old way because the good old way is not the way of Jesus. Because after all, don't most of us think most of the time that we're doing pretty good? We're doing all the things we're supposed to do, right? We make sure that Grand Central Station has enough food to feed the hungry that show up in the morning and in the afternoon. We open our church to the families in transition for family promise. We help stock the teacher lounges so that those who never get noticed actually are shown that there is some love for them in the world and beyond the the walls of the school building. We make sure that 18 children have enough school supplies to start on an equal playing field when they go to school every day. We bring things when the church asks us to bring things, even if it's a bag of candy. We put our trunks out there and we're nice to people that come by that don't go to our church. We do all kinds of really good things. But is that all Jesus is asking us to do? I'm not sure that Peter, James, and John understood what Jesus was asking them to do. I don't think he ever asked them to show up in temple an extra hour every week or to say a few extra prayers. I think what Jesus actually did when they walked away from the seashore is he said, just watch what I'm doing and then start doing some of that. So if you start reading all the stories that come after this, before the parables even enter the picture here, what you see is Jesus doing things like touching lepers, You know, those outcasts, those people nobody wants to be around because they're afraid of them. But remember, Jesus said, do not be afraid. Go and touch those people. Go and love those people. Let them have some dignity in their lives. 
You know, and then the very next thing is Jesus is telling the three of them that they should love the other as much as they want to be loved themselves, that they should not only pray for their enemies, but that they should love their enemies, that they should raise the walking dead to new life, that they should speak hope into people who are carrying despair in their hearts, that they should show people what the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven really looks like to not be afraid of those people who we try so hard to keep at arm's length by throwing some money in the plate. No, Jesus says, those are the very people that I came for. And it's up to you to go out into the world beyond the walls of whatever is comfortable for you, to break out of those safe little bubbles that you've put around yourselves and go and make a difference in the world you live in. You don't always have to do it with words. Sometimes just loving people is enough. And the other part of that is Jesus never commanded any of those people that he loved to believe in him. He just did things for people that demonstrated his love for them. And then they got to think about why. Why would somebody love me like that? The service that we do to others, with others, and for others, is really service to Christ. It is the service that reminds people that they have intrinsic value and worth and dignity, that they are worthy no matter where they are on the political, economic, social ladder. No matter where they were educated, no matter whether if they were educated, whether they drive a new car or a junker, It doesn't matter. What Jesus is saying is you have value, worth, dignity because you belong to the creator of the universe who called you very good. This is what it means to serve Jesus, to do the things that Jesus did so that others might recognize who they are and whose they are, regardless of what their choice is in their lifetime. Because, see, we're not going to judge them. We're going to show them mercy and let Jesus give them the grace that they don't deserve. You know, I was recently listening to a podcast this past week, and Father Doyle, who is the founder of Homeboy Ministries, um, was speaking, and he was talking about Homeboy Ministries. Let me just say this so you, you know what it is. It's in Los Angeles, California. It is the largest gang intervention program in the entire world. They have seen thousands and thousands of gang members come to faith in Christ, get their lives together, people who normally would be shooting at and killing one another live in community together. It is one of the most beautiful things you've ever seen. If you have 10 or 15 minutes, look up one of their testimonies on YouTube. That might change your life. It is amazing what Father Doyle has, um, and that organization has been able to to do in service to that particular group of people. Um, He said that, in that, he said, service in the name of Christ allows people to know that they are safe, which... Most people today need to know that they are safe. It allows people to know that they are safe, that they are seen, that they're not nobodies, but they're somebodies who are seen, and that they are cherished. When was the last time you told somebody they were cherished? How would that change someone's day? I'm coming down. Here's what we seem to forget when we serve others in the name of Christ. We forget that Christ serves us. That Christ leaves all the glory of the heavenly realm behind. And not only serves us, but gives up his life for us. Because we are safe we are seen, and we are cherished. And there's, there's an old story. Uh, I don't know who told it. I'm sure I heard it in a sermon. 
and I'm not exactly sure what the timeline of the story is, but it has to do with a little boy from a poor family, and so you might have heard this story. It's about a little boy from a poor family, uh, probably the turn of the 19th century, 20th century, when trains were just starting to, you know, come and go across the country. And in the story, the little boy is disabled. And we know back in those days, that still meant that, well, maybe God was punishing you for something. And the story goes that every day that boy would go to a train station with a basket, and in that basket, he would have some nuts and some fruit, and he would be selling those things to help his parents and his family have some money so that they could live. And one day as the train was pulling in, a man who was in a rush jumped off the train to get where he was going, and he ran right into that child. And that basket and all the things that were in it went flying all over the train platform. Picture that. And as he was scurrying to, to try to, to get the things that were in the basket, back in the basket, the man who ran into him looked at him and just got up and kept moving. When the train finally came to a stop, a, a well-dressed man got off the train and he was carrying with him a very nice briefcase, suitcase, I can't remember, <laughs> but he literally put it down where he was and he got on his hands and knees and he started helping that little boy pick up all his things and get him back to where he needed to be in his spot so he could continue doing what he was doing there. And he brushed the dust off him and he gave him a, a, you know, a few dollars so that he would have something to go home with that day. And when he was finished with that, he picked up his case and he started walking away. And the child looked as he was walking away and said, Hey, mister, are you Jesus? And we respond, singing verses 3 and 4 of hymn 344, Lord, you have come to the lake shore. <clears throat> you need my hands full of carry. constant love that keeps on loving. Oh Lord, with your eyes you have searched me, and while smiling have spoken my name. Now my boat's left on the shoreline behind me. seek other seas. You who have fished other oceans, ever long for by souls who are waiting, my loving friend, as thus you call me. We have come to that time of pastoral prayer, and just um, a brief word for those of you who don't know, Midge Foster went home uh, last week from the hospital and is recovering, 
um, will remain under doctor's care and there are a few more things that have to happen for her. So please keep Midge and her family in prayer as they continue uh, in her healing. Also keep in prayer this week the people of Puerto Rico who have been devastated one more time by the latest hurricane. And for the people in Florida and others in the Gulf who are preparing for yet another possible hurricane hitting land sometime in the next day to, to two days. Um, we know that there are wars and rumors of wars continuing around the world. We know that there is a lot of strife all over. People are sick. Um, and people are hurting. And so keep all these things in prayer um, as God is faithful to hear the prayers of his people. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we come before you this day knowing that the gift of your grace has been undeserved. And yet you who love us more than we could ever think or imagine are faithful to us that in all that we say and all that we do, you walk with us and you speak to us and you continue to invite us to follow you. So show us ways, O oh God, that we might continue to serve you and to serve those you love. Remind us that as much as we would like to believe that we've got it all figured out, we don't. But yet we also know, O oh God, that in a way that we will never fully be able to grasp, you are the one who has it all figured out. And that by being obedient to you and following you, we see what it means to be your people. Be with those this day who are hurting. Be with those in, in places where homes are devastated and life is upside down. For those whose minds have them trapped in a prison cell, oh God, have mercy. Help us, oh God, to be your hands and feet in this world that we might show others what you look like and give them an opportunity to see you, to know you, and to be loved by you. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we continue our worship, we continue that with our tithes and offerings. For those of you who are worshiping with us online, if you feel so led to uh, give an offering to this church today, there is an, a link for you to do that online. Uh, there are all the ways here that you can give. There are plates in the back and up in the front. There is electronic giving, mail. Um, there, and you could stop by the church office if that's how you prefer to give. But know that your giving is part of your worship and that God is faithful to multiply and to use for God's will and purpose all that is given in his son's name. And for that, the church thanks you for making our mission and ministry possible.
our closing hymn in the faith we sing, 2222, The Servant's Song. If you are interested in joining the church, feel free to come forward and meet with Pastor Denise. And as a note for the hymn, verse 6 is a repeat of verse 1, so you'll want to pay, pay attention to that. Let us join together in our closing hymn. Sister, let me serve you. Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. We are pilgrims on a journey. We're together. Receive now this benediction. In the waters of our baptism, we are all given a new last name, the name of Christian, which means that in some way we are brothers and sisters, one of the same God who has called us all together. And serving each other is nothing less than serving Christ himself. It is Christ who calls us to this place. It is Christ who sends us out so that we might be one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. May that be how our hearts and our minds and our souls move as we leave this place and go into the world. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.